Monikwitig. The Straight Mind. 1980. In recent years in Paris, language as a phenomenon has dominated modern theoretical systems and the social sciences and has entered the political discussions of the lesbian and women's liberation movements. This is because it relates to an important political field where what is at play is power, or more than that, a network of powers, since there is a multiplicity of languages that constantly act upon the social reality. The importance of languages such as a political stake has only recently been perceived. But the gigantic development of linguistics, the multiplication of schools of linguistics, the advent of the sciences of communication, and the technicality of the meta-languages that these sciences utilize, represent the symptoms of the importance of what is politically at stake. The science of language has invaded other sciences, such as anthropology through Levi Strauss, psychoanalysis through Lacan, and all the disciplines which have developed from the basis of structuralism. The early semiology of Roland Barthes has nearly escaped from linguistic domination to become a political analysis of the different systems of signs, to establish a relationship between this or that system of signs, for example, the myths of the petty bourgeois class, and the class struggle within capitalism that this system tends to conceal. We were almost saved, for political semiology is a weapon, a method, that we need to analyze what is called ideology. But the miracle did not last. Rather than introducing into semiology concepts which are foreign to it, in this case Marxist concepts, Barthes quickly stated that semiology was only a branch of linguistics and that language was its only object. Thus, the entire world is only a great register where the most diverse languages come to have themselves recorded, such as the language of the unconscious slash the language of fashion, the language of the exchange of women where human beings are literally the signs which are used to communicate. These languages, or rather these discourses, fit into one another, interpenetrate one another, support one another, reinforce one another, auto-engender, and engender one another. Linguistics engenders semiology and structural linguistics, structural linguistics engenders structuralism, which engenders the structural unconscious. The ensemble of these discourses produces a confusing static for the oppressed, which makes them lose sight of the material cause of their oppression and plunges them into a kind of a historic vacuum. For they produce a scientific reading of the social reality in which human beings are given as invariants, untouched by history and unworked by class conflicts, with identical psyches because genetically programmed. This psyche, equally untouched by history and unworked by class conflicts, provides the specialists, from the beginning of the 20th century, with a whole arsenal of invariants, the symbolic language which very advantageously functions with very few elements, since, like digits, 0 to 9, the symbols unconsciously produced by the psyche are not very numerous. Therefore, these symbols are very easy to impose, through therapy and theorization, upon the collective and individual unconscious. We are taught that the unconscious, with perfectly good taste, structures itself upon metaphors, for example, the name of the father, the Oedipus complex, castration, the murder or death of the father, the exchange of women, etc. If the unconscious, however, is easy to control, it is not just by anybody. Similar to mystical revelations, the apparition of symbols in the psyche demands multiple interpretations. Only specialists can accomplish the deciphering of the unconscious. Only they, the psychoanalysts, are allowed, authorized, to organize and interpret psychic manifestations which will show the symbol in its full meaning. And while the symbolic language is extremely poor and essentially lacunary, the languages or meta-languages which interpret it are developing, each one of them, with a richness, a display, that only theological exegeses of the Bible have equaled. Who gave the psychoanalysts their knowledge? For example, for Lacan, what he calls the psychoanalytic discourse, or the analytical experience, both teach him what he already knows. And each one teaches him what the other one taught him. But can we deny that Lacan scientifically discovered, through the analytical experience, somehow an experiment, the structures of the unconscious? Will we be irresponsible enough to disregard the discourses of the psychoanalyzed people lying on their couches? In my opinion, there is no doubt that Lacan found in the unconscious the structures he said he found there, since he had previously put them there. People who did not fall into the power of the psychoanalytical institution may experience an immeasurable feeling of sadness at the degree of oppression, of manipulation, 
that the psychoanalyzed discourses show. In the analytical experience there is an oppressed person, the psychoanalyzed, whose need for communication is exploited and who, in the same way as the witches could, under torture, only repeat the language that the inquisitors wanted to hear, has no other choice, if s slash he does not want to destroy the implicit contract which allows her slash him to communicate and which Slee needs, than to attempt to say what Slee is supposed to say. They say that this can last for a lifetime, cruel contract which constrains a human being to display her slash his misery to an oppressor who is directly responsible for it, who exploits her slash him economically, politely, ideologically and whose interpretation reduces this misery to a few figures of speech. But can the need to communicate that this contract implies only be satisfied in the psychoanalytical situation, in being cured or experimented with? If we believe recent testimonies by lesbians, feminists, and gay men, this is not the case. All their testimonies emphasize the political significance of the impossibility that lesbians, feminists, and gay men face in the attempt to communicate in heterosexual society, other than with a psychoanalyst. When the general state of things is understood, one is not sick or to be cured, one has an enemy, the result is that the oppressed person breaks the psychoanalytical contract. This is what appears in the testimonies, along with the teaching that the psychoanalytical contract was not a contract of consent but a forced one. The discourses which particularly oppress all of us, lesbians, women, and homosexual men, are those which take for granted that what founds society, any society, is heterosexuality. These discourses speak about us and claim to say the truth in an apolitical field, as if anything of that which signifies could escape the political in this moment of history, and as if, in what concerns us, politically insignificant signs could exist. These discourses of heterosexuality oppress us in the sense that they prevent us from speaking unless we speak in their terms. Everything which puts them into question is at once disregarded as elementary. Our refusal of the totalizing interpretation of psychoanalysis makes the theoreticians say that we neglect the symbolic dimension. These discourses deny us every possibility of creating our own categories. But their most ferocious action is the unrelenting tyranny that they exert upon our physical and mental selves. When we use the overgeneralizing term ideology to designate all the discourses of the dominating group, we relegate these discourses to the domain of irreal ideas, we forget the material, physical, violence that they directly do to the oppressed people, a violence produced by the abstract and scientific discourses as well as by the discourses of the mass media. I would like to insist on the material oppression of individuals by discourses, and I would like to underline its immediate effects through the example of pornography. Pornographic images, films, magazine photos, publicity posters on the walls of the cities, constitute a discourse, and this discourse covers our world with its signs, and this discourse has a meaning, it signifies that women are dominated. Semioticians can interpret the system of this discourse, describe its disposition. What they read in that discourse are signs whose function is not to signify and which have no raison d'etre except to be elements of a certain system or disposition. But for us this discourse is not divorced from the real as it is for semioticians. Not only does it maintain very close relations with the social reality which is our repression, economically and politically, but also it is in itself real since it is one of the aspects of oppression, since it exerts a precise power over us. The pornographic discourse is one of the strategies of violence which are exercised upon us, it humiliates, it degrades, it is a crime against our humanity. As a harassing tactic it has another function, that of a warning. It orders us to stay in line, and it keeps those who would tend to forget who they are in step, it calls upon fear. These same experts in semiotics, referred to earlier, reproach us for confusing, when we demonstrate against pornography, the discourses with the reality. They do not see that this discourse is reality for us, one of the facets of the reality of our oppression. They believe that we are mistaken in our level of analysis. I have chosen pornography as an example because its discourse is the most symptomatic and the most demonstrative of the violence which is done to us through discourses, as well as in the society at large. There is nothing abstract about the power that sciences and theories have to act materially and actually upon our bodies and our minds, even if the discourse that produces it is abstract. It is one of the forms of domination, its very expression. I would say, rather, one of its exercises. All of the oppressed know this power and have had to deal with it. 
It is the one which says, you do not have the right to speech because your discourse is not scientific and not theoretical, you are on the wrong level of analysis, you are confusing discourse and reality, your discourse is naive, you misunderstand this or that science. If the discourse of modern theoretical systems and social science exert a power upon us, it is because it works with concepts which closely touch us. In spite of the histo, Rick advent of the lesbian, feminist, and gay liberation movements, whose proceedings have already upset the philosophical and political categories of the discourses of the social sciences, their categories, thus brutally put into question, are nevertheless utilized without examination by contemporary science. They function like primitive concepts in a conglomerate of all kinds of disciplines, theories, and current ideas that I will call the straight mind. See The Savage Mind by Claude Lévi-Strauss, they concern woman, man, sex, difference, and all of the series of concepts which bear this mark, including such concepts as history, culture, and the real. And although it has been accepted in recent years that there is no such thing as nature, that everything is culture, there remains within that culture a core of nature which resists examination, a relationship excluded from the social in the analysis, a relationship whose characteristic is ineluctability in culture, as well as in nature, and which is the heterosexual relationship. I will call it the obligatory social relationship between man and woman. Here I refer to T. Grace Atkinson and her analysis of sexual intercourse as an institution, with its ineluctability as knowledge, as an obvious principle, as a given prior to any science. The straight mind develops a totalizing interpretation of history, social reality, culture, language, and all the subjective phenomena at the same time. I can only underline the oppressive character that the straight mind is clothed in in its tendency to immediately universalize its production of concepts into general laws which claim to hold true for all societies, all epochs, all individuals. Thus one speaks of the exchange of women, the difference between the sexes, the symbolic order, the unconscious, desire, jouissance, culture, history, giving an absolute meaning to these concepts when they are only categories founded upon heterosexuality, or thought which produces the difference between the sexes as a political and philosophical dogma. The consequence of this tendency towards universality is that the straight mind cannot conceive of a culture, a society where heterosexuality would not order not only all human relationships but also its very production of concepts and all the processes which escape consciousness, as well. Additionally, these unconscious processes are historically more and more imperative in what they teach us about ourselves through the instrumentality of specialists. The rhetoric which expresses them, and whose seduction I do not underestimate, envelops itself in myths, resorts to enigma, proceeds by accumulating metaphors, and its function is to poeticize the obligatory character of the you will be straight or you will not be. In this thought, to reject the obligation of coetus and the institutions that this obligation has produced as necessary for the constitution of a society, is simply an impossibility, since to do this would mean to reject the possibility of the constitution of the other and to reject the symbolic order, to make the constitution of meaning impossible, without which no one can maintain an internal coherence. Thus lesbianism, homosexuality, and the societies that we form cannot be thought of or spoken of, even though they have always existed. Thus, the straight mind continues to affirm that incest, and not homosexuality, represents its major interdiction. Thus, when thought by the straight mind, homosexuality is nothing but heterosexuality. Yes, straight society is based on the necessity of the different slash other at every level. It cannot work economically, symbolically, linguistically, or politically without this concept. This necessity of the different slash other is an ontological one for the whole conglomerate of sciences and disciplines that I call the straight mind. But what is the different slash other if not the dominated? For heterosexual society is the society which not only oppresses lesbians and gay men, it oppresses many different slash others, it oppresses all women in many categories of men, all those who are in the position of the dominated. To constitute a difference and to control it is an act of power, since it is essentially a normative act. Everybody tries to show the other as different. But not everybody succeeds in doing so. One has to be socially dominant to succeed in it. For example, the concept of difference between the sexes ontologically constitutes women into different slash others. Men are not different, whites are not different, nor are the masters. But the blacks, as well as the slaves, are. 
This ontological characteristic of the difference between the sexes affects all the concepts which are part of the same conglomerate. But for us there is no such thing as being woman or being man. Man and woman are political concepts of opposition, and the copula which dialectically unites them is, at the same time, the one which abolishes them. It is the class struggle between women and men which will abolish men and women. The concept of difference has nothing ontological about it. It is only the way that the masters interpret a historical situation of domination. The function of difference is to mask at every level the conflicts of interest, including ideological ones. In other words, for us, this means there cannot any longer be women and men, and that as classes and categories of thought or language they have to disappear, politically, economically, ideologically. If we, as lesbians and gay men, continue to speak of ourselves and to conceive of ourselves as women and as men, we are instrumental in maintaining heterosexuality. I am sure that an economic and political transformation will not de-dramatize these categories of language. Can we redeem slave? Can we redeem nigger, negress? How is woman different? Will we continue to write white, master, man? The transformation of economic relationships will not suffice. We must produce a political transformation of the key concepts, that is of the concepts which are strategic for us. For there is another order of materiality, that of language, and language is worked upon from within by these strategic concepts. It is at the same time tightly connected to the political field, where everything that concerns language, science and thought refers to the person as subjectivity and to her slash his relationship to society. And we cannot leave this within the power of the straight mind or the thought of domination. If among all the productions of the straight mind I especially challenge the models of the structural unconscious, it is because, at the moment in history when the domination of social groups can no longer appear as a logical necessity to the dominated, because they revolt, because they question the differences, Levi Strauss, Lacan, and their epigons call upon necessities which escape the control of consciousness and therefore the responsibility of individuals. They call upon unconscious processes, for example, which require the exchange of women as a necessary condition for every society. According to them, that is what the unconscious tells us with authority, and the symbolic order, without which there is no meaning, no language, no society, depends on it. But what does women being exchanged mean if not that they are dominated? No wonder then that there is only one unconscious, and that it is heterosexual. It is an unconscious which looks too consciously after the interests of the masters in whom it lives for them to be dispossessed of their concepts so easily. Besides, domination is denied, there is no slavery of women, there is difference. To which I will answer with this statement made by a Romanian peasant at a public meeting in 1848, why do the gentlemen say it was not slavery, for we know it to have been slavery, this sorrow that we have sorrowed. Yes, we know it, and this science of oppression cannot be taken away from us. It is from this science that we must track down the what goes without saying heterosexual, and, I paraphrase the early Roland Barthes, we must not bear seeing nature and history confused at every turn. We must make it brutally apparent that psychoanalysis after Freud and particularly Lacan have rigidly turned their concepts into myths, difference, desire, the name of the father, etc. They have even over mythified the myths an operation that was necessary for them in order to systematically heterosexualize that personal dimension which suddenly emerged through the dominated individuals into the historical field, particularly through women, who started their struggle almost two centuries ago. And it has been done systematically, in a concert of interdisciplinarity, never more harmonious than since the heterosexual myths started to circulate with these from one formal system to another like sure values that can be invested in anthropology as well as in psychoanalysis and in all the social sciences. This ensemble of heterosexual myths is a system of signs which uses figures of speech, and thus it can be politically studied from within the science of our oppression, for we know it to have been slavery as the dynamic which introduces the diachronism of history into the fixed discourse of eternal essences. This undertaking should somehow be a political semiology, though with this sorrow that we have sorrowed we work also at the level of language slash manifesto, of language slash action, that which transforms, that which makes history. In the meantime, in the systems that seemed so eternal and universal that laws could be extracted from them, laws that could be stuffed into computers, and in any case for the moment stuffed into the unconscious machinery, in these systems, thanks to our action and our language, shifts are happening. Such a model, as for example, 
the exchange of women, re-engulfs history in so violent and brutal a way that the whole system, which was believed to be formal, topples over into another dimension of knowledge. This dimension of history belongs to us, since somehow we have been designated, and since, as Levi Strauss said, we talk, let us say that we break off the heterosexual contract. So, this is what lesbians say everywhere in this country and in some others, if not with theories at least through their social practice, whose repercussions upon straight culture and society are still unenvisionable. An anthropologist might say that we have to wait for fifty years. Yes, if one wants to universalize the functioning of these societies and make their invariants appear. Meanwhile the straight concepts are undermined. What is woman? Panic, general alarm for an active defense. Frankly, it is a problem that the lesbians do not have became of a change of perspective, and it would be incorrect to say that lesbians associate, make love, live with women, for woman has meaning only in heterosexual systems of thought and heterosexual economic systems. Lesbians are not women, 